Let me start by thanking the authorities of the Munich School of Philosophy uh, and uh, Father Professor Godehard Brautrup in particular for having invited me here and uh, given an opportunity uh, to come up with some questions that have been uh, bothering me uh, since we started our research on using uh, neurofeedback method uh, to improve, broadly speaking, the ability of self-control. Uh, the subject area of the research we have been uh, carrying out <coughs> uh, in our lab of experimental psychology uh, at the Jesuit University Ignatianum uh, in Krakow, where I come from, uh, is back basically uh, psychophysiological, but the questions I have on my mind are rather of philosophical character and can be situated uh, I suppose in the field of uh, cognitive science. In particular, they can be considered, uh, for example, in the context of so-called neurophenomenology with its main objective, which is gathering scientific uh, community uh, to deliver tools and uh, practical solutions uh, for the hard problem of consciousness, articulated, as we know, in terms of the explanatory gap. And uh, within this uh, con uh, epistemological framework, the main issue I'm coming up with today uh, concerns uh, neurofeedback method and the concept of neurofeedback as a potential tool to bridge the ends of the explanatory gap. Uh, however, since I'm not a philosopher but a psychologist, I will just introduce some questions that should be, in my opinion, taken into consideration in this case. We'll briefly talk them over and would of course be very grateful for, your, for all your comments uh, as philosophers in a strict sense. Uh, this could be, by the way, an example of interdisciplinary approach uh, combining uh, empirical and uh, conceptual uh, perspective and uh, also an exercise for the cooperation between our partner schools, the Munich School of Philosophy and the Jesuit Un uh, University Ignatianum in, in Krakow. So in other words, uh, uh, the term uh, bridge uh, is supposed to be a light motive of my visit, uh, the question of bridging the explanatory gap and bridging our uh, partner schools. Uh, so respectively, I will start uh, with a brief review of our research uh, on self-control and uh, neurofeedback or using neurofeedback uh, method to improve it. Actually, I could easily uh, spur this part, but since I know the question of self-control self is also one of the important subjects of uh, your research here, I thought uh, you might find it interesting uh, at least to compare our approaches. And then I'll proceed to describe uh, uh, the method of neurofeedback and the paradigm of neurofeedback uh, and consider uh, if it could be put in the explanatory gap. As far as uh, self-control by and large uh, is considered, uh, in psychology, because as I said, my perspective today is going to be uh, mostly psychology, uh, psychological. In psychology, uh, the question of self-control or self-control is understood basically, uh, I would say, in two ways. Uh, as a personality trait, uh, which means that the ability to uh, monitor, control and regulate one's own behavior <coughs> Uh, is an underlying essential aspect of psychological functioning quite stable across the lifespan. Uh, 
the examples of such, a, uh, such an approach are, uh, as I put it here, for instance, Julian Rotter's theory of locus of control, C. Robert uh, Cloninger's uh, theory of character, or Detsy and Ryan's self-determination theory of motivation. So this approach obviously is quite uh, uh, typical for personality theories. But in psychology, uh, self-control is also understood as a cognitive process, obviously mostly uh, in the area of cognitive science. Uh, and in such cases, it's articulated in terms of executive functions uh, like inhibition, attentional control, flexibility, planning, and so on, uh, and uh, so, so on. In our chair of general psychology, we have been studying self-control actually using uh, both approaches. Uh, we are just concluding, for instance, a, res a research project uh, on possible relation between uh, character and temperament. Uh, for example, does high reactivity as a temperamental trait correlate positively or negatively uh, with character, or there's no relevant relation between them? Or uh, does something that we call difficult temperament uh, that consists of high reactivity, uh, high sensitivity, or getting tired easily, uh, makes the process of development of character easier or rather more difficult. One would think that uh, uh, it's probably more difficult because uh, uh, it's more difficult to control highly energetic behaviors, high, highly energetic uh, uh, reactions, for, for, for example, strong emotions. But one may also think that it's quite on the contrary. I mean, uh, the so-called difficult temperament creates an opportunity or conditions uh, to practice character, uh, so to develop it. Uh, of course, uh, when we talk about possible conditions uh, determining self-control, there's no way to avoid mentioning biological theories uh, explaining, uh, sorry, according to which uh, the quality of self-control as a personality trait or as an uh, or as a, um, executive functioning uh, depends on uh, neural activity of some brain regions, mainly frontal lobes. For example, inhibitory deficits in cases of ADHD so attention deficit hyperactivity uh, disorder, are said to result from a reduced arousal of uh, these brain regions measured uh, in terms of elevated so-called theta-beta power ratio, uh, which means higher ratio of slow wave activity uh, relatively to fast wave activity, as well as uh, reduced glucose metabolism uh, comparing to the control group. And this is where neurofeedback comes in, actually. Uh, one of the most popular neurofeedback protocols uh, used in ADHD aims to decrease uh, theta activity and increase uh, beta activity. By the way, as a part of uh, another research project carried out in our lab of experimental psychology, we have also been using uh, this training protocol to test its effectiveness in improving inhibitory skills uh, of elderly people. Uh, we know from the literature uh, that uh, executive uh, functioning or the ability of self-control, the quality of self-control drops in time. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, the effectiveness of uh, uh, executive functions uh, is lower uh, in case of elderly people. Uh, there is a very interesting phenomenon, I don't know if you experienced it or not, uh, in, uh, as a technical term, psychological ter technical term, it's called off-target verbosity, which, um, uh, to put it plainly, means uh, talkativeness. And uh, uh, we become more and more talkative uh, 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 while uh, aging, 
for instance, uh, when I meet uh, or when I met for the first time my masters, my professors, when I participated in a, uh, a, a master degree uh, uh, project, they were, it was about 20 years ago, uh, they were cute, the answers were very straight to the point. Now, when I talk to the same people actually, my professors or professors uh, who are uh, uh, employed in our institute, the same people who are ve still very smart, very intelligent, become uh, uh, more and more talkative and before they answer my question they just like go around and around or uh, they just slide away uh, uh, to many uh, uh, different topics be before uh, they get back uh, uh, to, uh, to the point that I said. Uh, so the phenomenon uh, which is the deficit of inhibitory functioning is very similar to this one of ADHD. Uh, so when we know that neurofeedback uh, method it's quite effective in cases of ADHD and we know that uh, from the literature, we just made up, uh, made up our mind to check its effectiveness uh, in case of uh, uh, improving uh, self-control uh, ability uh, uh, of elderly people. But what actually is neurofeedback and how does it work? Uh, neurofeedback can be described as a process of providing individuals with information about their own brain activation to be changed in result of the spontaneous psychological actions. The changes are recorded, processed and displayed back uh, to them online in form of visual or audio signals through what is known as a neurofeedback loop. Uh, during neurofeedback session or during neurofeedback sessions, participants are supposed to achieve a predefined threshold of uh, neural arousal by variations of the mental contents in order to find an exact mental state that correlates with the physiological marker. Uh, what we can see here is an interface that is actually uh, combined by uh, two uh, uh, screens. Uh, what you see on the left is what uh, a trainer or a therapist see, sees, and what you see on the right is uh, what is seen by a patient or uh, a trainee. Uh, those three bars on the left uh, are thresholds or reflect uh, the power ratio of certain brain waves, uh, like uh, in this case uh, theta power ratio and two bands of uh, uh, beta power ratio. Uh, uh, and the task of uh, the, uh, the uh, trainer or uh, the therapist is to set a certain threshold uh, for uh, the participant uh, to be achieved. Of course, on the basis of uh, uh, quantitative uh, EEG examination before, uh, on certain, of course, sites on the scalp. Uh, how, and uh, what is uh, on the right is the, the screen uh, which is seen by, for instance, ADHD kit or uh, anybody who's uh, taking part uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in the training. Uh, every time the participant uh, manages to hit this threshold, doing something, I will explain it uh, later, it's uh, rewarded uh, by moving the boat, for instance. So uh, in this particular case, uh, the participant's case is to uh, um, is to make the boat uh, which is in the middle uh, to win the race because this boat uh, uh, reflects uh, the uh, better power ratio, better one power ratio, which is the most desirable uh, to improve uh, in this case. Uh, 
uh, the participants, for example, think about, imagine or remember different things or evoke different emotions and are then informed about repercussions the psychological activity has on the psychological, sorry, on the physiological conditions and can learn to establish a link between the two domains to be able to bring them about willfully without the device in future. So uh, uh, the point of the training actually uh, is for the participant to uh, find out what to do psychologically uh, to get a reward, uh, to be able to sustain the same, the same state, mental state, uh, in reality without the device uh, uh, later on. But to make the ends of this neurofeedback loop meet, the brain-computer interface also serves to mirror mental states themselves, although from the side of uh, the physiological counterparts. The process of modulating them is supposed to lead to changes in the psychological correlates. In other words, I'm not only supposed to manipulate my mental content in order to bring about certain physiological state, but also the other way around. I'm supposed to regulate my neural activation in order to change my psychological functioning. Neurofeedback is uh, thus believed to diminish the physiological consequences of brain damage after stroke, uh, to relieve symptoms of uh, Parkinson's disease, or to treat ep epilepsy proneness. So neurofeedback is used to change physiological parameters, right, that's true. It is, however, also used to enable individuals to modulate the own brain processes, but in order to exert in this way control over the psychological activity. As it is, for example, in such cases like emotional control, autism, uh, or ADHD, as I said it before. Neurofeedback is not, however, used only to help the subject bring about some predefined physiological conditions or to achieve some predefined psychological state correlating with predefined neural condition. It is also supposed to serve as a method to find out the functional role of precise cortical regions. Such an approach to human brain mapping is referred to as a brain TV. It's quite a popular uh, 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 website, uh, Brain TV, when people mostly with epilepsy uh, uh, visit uh, because the, brain, uh, the, the website and the uh, experiments that stand before, uh, behind the, the website uh, concern uh, mostly epilepsy. Uh, it uses a setup that consists of intracerebral EEG recording system and a, dis and a display which allows online monitoring of uh, the reactivity of precise neural populations uh, in various psychological circumstances. In this way, it is possible to answer the question which specific cognitive events evoke certain neural responses and which do not and to establish precise correlations. For instance, uh, when uh, he, hypothetic, uh, hypothetically I'm an uh, epileptic patient and I'm switched on or connected to this uh, device, I can uh, uh, compare different content of my uh, uh, cognitive functioning and to see which of this content makes me closer uh, to uh, this specific neural activation that is specific for uh, uh, epileptic uh, attack. Uh, so I got this uh, uh, feedback back uh, when I'm getting closure, when I'm getting away from, uh, 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 from this undesirable uh, state. And in this way, I can learn actually to avoid psychologically, to avoid getting close uh, 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 to epileptic seizure. Uh, 
In this way, during neural feedback session, the brain-computer interface functions like a mirror in which I simultaneously see myself in third-person perspective, in bodily or physical form, or neurophysiological form, I should rather say, and experience mental states of myself in first-person perspective. In the process, both aspects turn out to mutually constrain each other in the course of the individual's actions. Uh, there is a small but influential uh, literature uh, suggesting that neurofeedback technology and even something called the neurofeedback paradigm uh, can help to meet the main objective of one of the uh, latest proposals how to address the heart problem of consciousness, the proposal that his co-founder Francisco Varela called uh, the project of naturalizing phenomenology or just neurophenomenology. I have neither enough expertise nor enough time today to analyze if uh, the objective of neurophenomenology is really to solve the hard problem and to close the explanatory gap or just to promote certain ways for more practical marrying between domain of experience and neuroscience. There are serious doubts about it. My aim now, anyway, is to discuss whether the neurofeedback paradigm can help to close uh, the, explanatory gap, the explanatory gap uh, in its classical meaning. As we know, the, uh, the explanatory gap, which is the hard problem formula introduced by Joseph Levine, refers to a discrepancy between the phenomenal character of experience and the physical nature of the brain. The phenomena of human experience appear different, they look different uh, from the brain processes, no, or are experienced different, no matter how strictly they mutually constrain each other and are articulated by different categories. Moreover, the subject's mental events, which relate to brain processes, can be approached in either of two ways, in first person, and third-person perspective. Subsequently, as private ones, they may be given to mine, uh, uh, sorry, they may be given to me, or they may be given to be mine exclusively, which means it's, it is me and only me who can directly con ex exert control on them. Uh, the other way is indirect. In this perspective, mental events take place in the brain, which is however given to me from the outside only as a solid body. That is why I can never penetrate it to get in touch with them directly. I can never penetrate the brain of my patient uh, or the brain of the participant of our experiment to get in touch with the mental states that are suppose, supposedly uh, uh, take, uh, taking place uh, in it. That is, uh, uh, neurofeedback method makes it possible to monitor the subject's online neural activity as a response to the psychological actions. Moreover, in this approach, the subjects are given a more active role in research process since they can provide scientists with a first-person accounts on the mental activities, which are considered as relevant research data. Uh, and this is according uh, to some scholars enough to effectively address the heart problem. Uh, what you can see here uh, is not very rare, actually. There is a small but quite influential uh, literature suggesting that the, neuro that, that the technology of neurofeedback uh, um, and so even something that we can call the neurofeedback paradigm can really help to close the explanatory gap. As we can read here, uh, this, this article from very well-established international journal, because information from first and third person perspectives are united and co-determine each other in uh, the iterative loop of real-time neurofeedback, the epistemological concern of how to relate neural and personal data, data is resolved, the uh, authors uh, write. 
a meaningful link between subjective and uh, neuroscientific data is created through this uh, causal relationship. Well, as I said, I'm not a philosopher, uh, but I would not subscribe to this point of view because of at least some questions that uh, can only be briefly underlined here. The first doubt, concern, my first doubt uh, concerning such an approach or such an opinion that uh, we have actually found the tool to close the explanatory gap, my first doubt concerns the scientific status uh, uh, of uh, first-person uh, uh, accounts. It is, of course, not my intention to conclude the debate on the value of phenomenal data in science. I only intend to point out that neither statistically relevant correlations between subjects' first-person accounts on the mental contents and concomitant neural conditions, nor any disciplined methods for the first-person study of consciousness are enough to avoid reservations concerning the scientific value of introspective approaches. And neurofeedback does not give us anything new uh, in this matter. The neurofeedback paradigm does not provide any new ways to rise up the curtain of subjects' privacy. To put it plainly, uh, the changes of neural activity resulted from putative mental processes reported by subjects are not an immediate and certain proof that they really encounter what they report on. Uh, uh, frankly speaking, uh, I don't have I didn't have any tool to be sure that my uh, patients uh, really uh, experience what they are talking about they ex are experiencing uh, at the moment. Neurofeedback uh, does not provide me uh, uh, such a tool, such a, uh, a lying detector, for instance. In other words, the researchers have an immediate access to the subject's neural processes, but only in direct uh, insight uh, into the mental states. It was like this before and the problem still remains. Apart from uh, this discontinuity between first and third person perspective uh, on the neurophenomenological uh, relation, however, sorry, however mutual uh, constraint it is, neurofeedback also turns out insufficient to explain intrinsic difference in nature of neural and phenomenal data. The subject's accounts of the conscious experience and the neural counterparts discovered in the result of neurofeedback implementation remain for experimenters, for scientists, as different as ever. Pain is not the firing of C-fibers as it was not before. Uh, so uh, neurofeedback uh, uh, does not provide us with a tool uh, to overcome this discrepancy between what I see in my brain, even if this is my brain, and what I experience. Uh, so the second point of the heart problem formula uh, uh, again, still remains. In the face of such essential obstacles to overcome this discontinuity between first-person and third-person perspectives, as well as between first-person and third-person data, neurofeedback can be still considered as a useful tool to carry out a potentially highly effective heuristic strategy in finding a, a reciprocal causation between neural and mental events. That's true, of course. In this way, phenomenal data can heuristically serve to guide the investigation of the neuroscientific structure of the mind and the other way around. Uh, this is something new uh, comparing to a classical, for instance, EEG or even fMRI. Uh, uh, we have a online feedback on what we feel or what we experience and in this way we can establish uh, uh, I think uh, more strict connections between those two domains. Uh, 
Is there, however, any other perspective within which neurofeedback may be considered as a useful tool to close the explanatory gap? There is a small but interesting literature suggesting it can. Uh, as I said it before, during neurofeedback sessions, from the scientist's perspective, there is the epistemological dissociation between first-person and third-person data, right? When I am a, a um, neuroscientist, uh, I have an immediate access only to brain processes, so I have an immediate aspect, uh, access sorry, to the brain in third person perspective, but I don't have uh, an immediate aspect to the first person perspective. Uh, so what would be this another perspective that would be worth to take into consideration in case of neurofeedback, maybe to close the explanatory gap. Since there are only two parties involved in uh, this situation, I mean uh, the scientist and the subject, right? Uh, it would be or it must be the subject standpoint. In this perspective, let's think about it, uh, from the subject standpoint, not from uh, the experimenter's uh, standpoint, uh, he or she has immediate access to his or her own mental events and can also observe neural processes on the same terms as the, as the scientist, but from within the brain, right? as it is sometimes called from a first brain perspective. Such an approach can also be dubbed, uh, I don't know actually if it's dubbed in this way in literature, it's my invention, uh, but we, we can call it personal or private neuro neuroscience. Right? So I have exactly the same access uh, to my private mental states, but now I have also an access to my uh, uh, brain processes, to my neural processes. Does it mean that having immediate access to my mental states as well as to my brain through neurofeedback, I can loop a neurophenomenological circulation in the way to make it possible to close explanatory gap by building some kind of first-person neuroscience. This is another term for, 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 for such an approach, first-person neuroscience. Does it mean that uh, uh, from this perspective it is possible to do it? It seems to me it is not enough since another condition of the heart problem formula, which is the discrepancy between the phenomenal character of experience and the physical nature of the brain, remains. Okay, now I have the same access to my mental states and to my uh, 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 brain processes, yet they still remain different. When I feel something, I encounter it as a something quite different what I see, uh, for instance, here, right? Uh, 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 neural circulation, uh, uh, my neural processes, even if I'm informed about them, are still different than my emotions, my... Uh, uh, um, recollections of uh, childhood past and so on and so on. To recall neurofemonologists, closing the explanatory gap would require such a framework within which phenomenal properties will be continuous with the properties accepted by the uh, neural sciences, and the link between both will be meaningful. And uh, we have to do this to close the explanatory gap, uh, to find uh, such a way uh, that would 
uh, make phenomenal events continuous with uh, neural uh, processes uh, uh, to m make this relation meaningful. Although it is not entirely clear what this continuity and meaningfulness is supposed to mean, I just cite the literature, then neuro for, for instance, Francisco Varela. Uh, although it's not exactly clear what they mean by that, I presume it must have something to do with some common characteristics both domains, neural and phenomenal, would share. Otherwise, we merely arrive at some casual traffic between mind and matter that is no more intelligible than it was for René Descartes. But has neurofeedback got anything to do with it? Has neurofeedback, uh, neurofeedback uh, uh, could or can neurofeedback be considered as a something provided us with some uh, theoretical conceptual uh, framework to make uh, what is uh, neural continuous with what is mental uh, uh, to find some common characteristics of what is uh, in this domain and of what is in that domain. What would neurofeedback have to do with this? Well, actually, I think it may turn out it does. <laughs> it may, uh, uh, in my naive, of course, opinion, as I said, I'm talking to the philosophers, uh, who will probably quite soon crush me, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but let me first express my idea. Mm -hmm. At, uh, or at least, I should say, it may be interesting to consider uh, this idea I, I'm, going, I'm just about to talk about, uh, and at least to some extent, or in some aspect of the, of the explanatory gap. Uh, when we look at the question of therapeutic efficiency of neurofeedback and its specific goal in particular cases, like epilepsy, emotional control, or ADHD, we can notice uh, it aims not so much at the content of behavior as at the formal characteristics of behavior, which means it is supposed to regulate the energetic level of either neural activation or psychological functioning, or both, uh, should I rather say. When we uh, analyze in which cases neurofeedback uh, turns out to be effective, we'll find out that it's effective in regulating energetic level uh, either of behavior or energetic level of uh, uh, neural uh, activation. The energetic substrate as an essential factor to be modulated in such cases can be easily seen, for example, on the presented screens. Uh, the aim of neurofeedback protocols is to reduce or to increase power, power ratio of certain brain frequ uh, frequencies, which is supposed to be reflected by the level of psychological arousal too. So on one side we have power ratio, we have the level of uh, neural arousal, and uh, in another domain we talk about exactly the same thing. I mean arousal, again arousal, right? So we have the same term, which is basically physical term, uh, that fits in here and in here. So maybe this energetic substrate can be considered as a meaningful bridge uh, that neurophenomenologists uh, have been looking for to make phenomenal properties can, and this is the citation, continuous with the properties accepted by the natural scientists. Uh, sorry, by, by the natural sciences. The notion of energetic substrate of human and not only human actions can be traced down in history at least as early as to uh, Aristotle's hilomor hilomorphism, uh, but more precisely uh, his distinction between potentiality and actuality. Potentiality in uh, uh, old Greek uh, uh, dunamis, right? Uh, like something dynamic. Mm -hmm. In, uh, and 
this distinction, uh, especially potentiality, as far as I know, uh, refers mostly to matter, not to soul, not to form, but to matter. Right? In modern psychology, it's very, uh, very similar. In modern psychology, a renaissance of interest in such concepts as level of arousal, degree of uh, excitation, energy mobilization, energy level, etc., can be largely credited to Robert Ye uh, Yerkes and John Dodson or Elizabeth Duffy, and is significantly expressed in modern theories of temperament as well as intelligence. Uh, in one of leading uh, modern uh, theory of intelligence, uh, what is uh, 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 actually it's called formal theory of intelligence. Intelligence consists of three uh, uh, factors: uh, working memory. Uh, uh, yes, working memory. Uh, we know that, but the level of excitation without arousal, uh, we wouldn't be able to put to work our working memory. Uh, so it does not only concern uh, uh, um, uh, temperament, but other psychological uh, terms too. Uh, not to mention theories referring to such clinical conditions uh, as mood disorders. Apart from those concepts that refer to rather unspecific overall level of arousal, as an energetic aspect of various mental actions, there is also a significant amount of ongoing uh, research concerning the role of energetic aspect of specific mental processes, such as self-control. One may, for instance, point out to the strength model of self-control proposed by Roy, uh, Roy Baumeister and Associates, uh, and the title of one of the prominent articles, which reads, and this is the, the whole title, uh, as you probably know because you probably read it. Self-control relies on glucose as a limited energy source. Subtitle, willpower is more than a metaphor. Although the authors uh, uh, do not elaborate on the question more, the phrase willpower is more than a metaphor suggests that a, a physical term power is meant to describe isomorphically the quality of the neural process as well as its phenomenal counterpart. In other words, it's formally th the same thing given, however, from two different sides, from the outside and the inside of the conscious organism. In this theoretical framework, neurofeedback could be considered as a method of modulating the level of arousal of energetic corporeal character by providing the subject with the information on its neural aspect. I would be able to exert control on my brain activity, although it is given from outside in neurofeedback mirror, because the neural processes are bodily expressions of equally corporeal mental processes which are experienced and directly act upon uh, within the inner space of my body. There are just two sides, private and objective, of the same body which belongs to the only one agent who is myself. In this way, through neurofeedback, I encounter my corporeal self from the sides, uh, uh, sorry, from two sides at the same time, sus uh, sustaining a neurophenomenological continuity. Just like, uh, just like in the mirror. Neurofeedback just uh, acts like a mirror uh, that shows me exactly the same what I experience from the inside uh, uh, out, but from the outside in. But we talk about the same thing. I, I mean uh, corporeal uh, activation, uh, energy of, uh, uh, of behavior and energy of uh, neural processes that condition it. The gap is linked meaningfully by this corporeal uh, uh, substrate, uh, in my uh, humble opinion, and I would, uh, th 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 that would be it, uh, as far as uh, I'm concerned. Thank you very much.